Hey, look at that. Hello. We're back. It's good to be back. I'm Mike, your host. Uh, we should have a special guest today. Um, she'll be slipping in later. Uh, my esteemed guest on the radio show, uh, Laurie McEnany. But right now, <coughs> we're live on Facebook. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the people who will be coming in today, who will be studying with us, and I ask you to bless our Bible study and guide us through this time. Uh, keep us free from any distractions, please. And I ask um, that you just guide us through uh, knowing more about you, who you are and how you are and who we are in you. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Got a little bit too much light on me here. There you go. Yeah, okay. Hey, Joy Clausen, it's good to see you. So we are in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 7. And, and we saw this in... Um, oh, whoa, what's going on here? It's kind of jump, popping up on my screen. Hey, Stacy. It's good to see you, too. So we're in uh, Romans 8, verse 7. And this is what we've seen so far. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, <clears throat> who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Why? So that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. Nor, nor indeed can be. So hey, Melissa Myers, it's good to see you too. Um, last time we saw this, we're going to look at the New American Standard Version. That was the New King James. Hey, Joe. Um, in the New American Standard, it says, Because the mindset in the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, is not even able to do so. And so we, we saw that to be rather, rather uh, daunting last time to think that we as born-again people can have a style of living which is dependent not upon God all the time, but often upon the things of the earth, and that God sees us as hostility towards himself. Uh, Stacy, I wanted to tell you that my friend um, John Neal and I passed through Winnie, Texas, on Friday. So we're pretty close, but we had to hurry home because we had been away for three days. We went fishing on the Bolivar Peninsula and um, Peninsula for redfish and, uh, hey Gary, and for speckled trout and whatever else God wanted to give us. And what God wanted us to have was several small fish that were not, you know, we just thrown back. And um, the legal limit of speckled trout um, legal speckled trout, which is three each, for John and I. We, caught, we didn't see one red fish the whole time. But I wanted to tell you, I was in your neighborhood, kind of, and um, that's where all the mosquitoes are, in case y'all want to know. Yeah, we were pretty close, and I thought about it, but we, we had to hurry home. Laura, I hadn't seen Laurie in three days. He hadn't seen his wife in the same amount of time. We just, we missed him, and so we went home. So... So there's a clause here at the end of Romans 8, 7. Oh, by the way, Stacy, hopefully this summer, Laurie and I will get down to, um, to your area, to Houston. When we do, we'll go back up through your town if we can and connect with you there. Um, so there's two clauses in this sentence, Romans 8, 7. 
because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And the second clause comes after the semicolon, and it says, for, for it is not, uh, the colon, it is not subject to the law of God, nor can be. So I see this clause in two lights. The first is the generic look at the idea of not being subject to the law of God in general. Um, this term, subject to, means to instinctively place oneself under the authority of another. And so, um, because of the rebelliousness which came in to mankind with the fall of man, lost people can never do that. And neither can save people who are focused on the flesh. And so it, we don't instinctively place ourselves under God's authority. And the other way I see this clause in this verse has to do with another meaning of the term, the law of God. And so I'm going to um, quote out of Matthew 22 here, verses 35 to, uh, through 40. So Jesus in this, in this um, quote is um, there's some um, legalistic Jews who are trying to catch him, catch Jesus in, in a, um, a bind to try to out logic um, the king of glory. And so he says, then one of them, a lawyer, asked him, Jesus, a question, testing him. In other words, trying to catch him, catch him in the jam. Saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so this is my point. When a person has his mind set on the flesh, he cannot truly love the Lord God with all his heart, neither can he truly love his neighbor. When we live that way, all we really are thinking about is ourselves. It's about us. We're too busy doing that to consider what God cares about or about what another person needs. And I hope that makes sense. Um, when we're busy focusing on the flesh, we do so because we're desperate. And we're desperate to make sure the kid, us, gets what we need or we think we need. And so when we, we are living that way, we, uh, we can't really, really care about what God wants. Because we're too busy trying to get what we want. And that, that's, a, that's a shame. But that's the way most, mankind, most humankind lives. And so... Um, because of that, we look around and we see a whole bunch of needs that never get addressed that God would like to tug on our heartstrings and get us to it, right? He says, again, out of Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. It just can't, right? Not only are we, are we not subject to God's law, but we flat out cannot do it. And I find that to be extremely sad concerning myself and also concerning my brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I think it's the New American Standard. Um, it might be the, King, the, New, New, the NIV, the New International Version. Uh, translates flesh as self. And the reason it does that is because the flesh is most concerned about oneself. It's self-ish, if, if you catch my drift. It's self-focused and self-oriented. Not only is it concerned about what it wants, and all of us have this, but also believes that it can meet its own needs. That we can, if you will, lift ourselves up by our bootstraps, which if you've ever tried to do, never works, right? I mean, you might get a little bit of air, like about that much, but that's all you're going to get. So now we go to Romans 
8.8. So we advanced the whole verse today. So then, so then he, he, he starts to summarize this part of the scripture. He says, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And at this point, it is important that we, that we zoom in on one tiny, yet an important word. Hey, Michael Bogle, welcome home from, from our, your travels, two weeks of travel. I uh, got to meet Michael and his wife, Karen, I believe it is. Um, they came through our town on their way from Hattiesburg to where they were going on their mammoth trip. And uh, we got to eat a meal with them. I got to show them the worldwide headquarters and only office of Mike McInerney Ministries and the radio studio. So it was really good to meet a brother in Christ. This man uh, went to school with my little brother. Keith, I believe it is. I, I can't remember which one it was, Keith or Kevin. But it's kind of cool to meet, meet this man and um, get to know him and see that he's a brother in Christ now. Um, and so we're looking at this verse, and there's that word in, in the term in the flesh. And it seems like such a tiny word. But we see the term in Christ all over the epistles, particularly in Paul's writings. Humans can either be in Christ or not be in Christ. And just to clear it up, those who are in Christ are born again. And those who are not in Christ, well, they're still lost. They're still hell bound. And so there's only one way to come into Christ, and that is to be baptized into Christ. And that baptism, I'm not talking about water baptism. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit of God baptizing. Um, we we're baptized by one spirit into one body. And, and so when we were saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ. And then later, someone immersed us in water. And that's a true baptism in water because you're fully immersed. That's why sprinkling doesn't approximate the totality of the spiritual baptism that the Holy Spirit does because sprinkling just gets you a little bit wet. Baptism is a total immersion. The word baptizo, it means to be immersed in whatever it is in which we're being baptized. And so it's important that we enact that, reenact that <coughs> through a physical baptism to help us comprehend the totality of the change that's come over our whole being when we're baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit of God. So the term in the flesh, when he says it's um, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, the term in the flesh is synonymous with saying that lost people cannot please God. Therefore, as a person who is in the flesh, a lost person truly cannot please him. And these are completely, these people who are lost, who are in the flesh, are completely under the control of their sinful nature, their self, or, in other words, they're under control of their own flesh. So they find themselves living, really, a spiritually primitive way of being. No matter how brilliant they are, no matter how educated they are, no matter what their pedigree is on the earth, how many letters they have before or after their name, if we're lost, we're not pleasing to God. If we're saved, we are pleasing because we're his kids, we're his children, and he's pleased with us. I mean, look at what God said from heaven as Jesus was, was baptized by his cousin John the Baptizer. Um, he says, Behold, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, now you and I are sons and da daughters of the Most High God. And because of that, he's pleased with us because we have relationship now. So I'm going to quote out of one of my favorite commentaries, the Life Application New Testament commentary on this topic. And then I'm going to paste it here.
Those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God because they're interested only in themselves and have cast aside the one and only power that can defeat sin. The mind directed by the sinful nature or the flesh can only be devoted to its own self-gratification, which will lead to destruction. Now this is important to consider when we encounter kind, generous, and benevolent people who seem to love other people but might be lost, right? Some of these will state that they will go to heaven when they die because they are good people who do good things. And you know, I wish so much that were true. But it's not. I wish that were true. But it's really not the way this works. I wish it did. Sadly, it is not true. Now how can we say this? Because the scripture is clear that salvation is by faith and not through works. And remember, you can always comment, ask questions about the study, you can challenge anything I say, and you can paste the scripture if you want. Let's let's while we're talking about pasting scriptures, let's paste one out of Titus chapter three. And then we'll look at one out of Ephesians 2. This is important. It's important that we go over these things and that we're equipped with these things because there are many in the body of Christ, especially in the works-based portions of the splintered out body of Christ that we're a part of. You know, it's, it's been so splintered by Satan and, and broken into denominations and congregations and styles and there's so much warring between them with the body of Christ that's schizophrenic and it's fighting itself. Many in the works-based types of Christendom really believe that they're going to heaven because they do good things. The lost people do good things. Listen to what Paul wrote to Titus in this verse and to us in this verse. See, we, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures. I mean, look at that term. That lust in our hearts that we actually serve them like servants. And pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, which is a beautiful statement, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is a proof verse that Jesus is God, because he says, according, um, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior came, then he says, Jesus Christ our Savior, which is our Savior. Well, they're both God, right? Um, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It wasn't through works. He's, he makes it a point to say, not by works of righteousness which we've done. Our works of righteousness didn't save us in the first place, and our works of righteousness don't allow us to remain saved. God is sufficient to do that. And another verse out of Ephesians 2, 8 to, um, to 9, I believe, yeah, 8 to 9. He says this, and this is the one most people are familiar with, because it's shorter, so people use it in their sermons more. But, but um, both of these say the same thing. In fact, I, I think I post these in here so people can go over them again, or you can cut and paste them into a Word document while you're in the study. So you can study through it later. Write the notes down and look at it in your Bible. See if it doesn't really say this. Um, the one that we're most familiar with is Ephesians 2. 
For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And you know, if we could be saved by our works, there would be plenty of people telling you why they were saved because of their works, how awesome their works are. And in fact, there's plenty of people that do that right now. And people who don't study the Word of God fall for it because they don't know that the Scripture teaches otherwise. Jesus is the workman who does the work of salvation, not us. If we, if we could, like I say often, he could have stayed home. He could have just sent some instructions. Here, do these eight things and you'll be all right. You know, that's not what he did because we couldn't do the eight things. We couldn't do one. So I hope that's clear. So the truth is that doing good things, as nice as it is, will not redeem lost people. So good people doing good things doesn't make them saved and doesn't earn them God's love and God's admiration and God's acceptance. In Acts chapter 4, Peter said something since he was filled with the Spirit or empowered by the Holy Spirit, which is what filled with the Spirit means. guided and led by the Holy Spirit. He said this out of Acts chapter 4 verses 8 to 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judge for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, then let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. How would you like to have somebody say that to you? <laughs> and it be true. Whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this Jesus of Nazareth, this man stands before you whole. This is the stone, Jesus which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name on he under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Only Jesus saves. Our works do not save. Our great attitude does not save. Putting on a, hip a happy face does not save us. The Lord Jesus saves us. So back to Romans 8.8. 8. I'm hitting this hard for two reasons. One is because most of us in the body of Christ never hear a teaching on flesh. And if we do, it's basically sex, drugs, and rock and roll kind of stuff. You know, bad sins as opposed to what good sins <laughs> but um flesh is a mindset flesh is an attitude flesh is a tool that we use in lieu of trusting the lord instead of trusting the lord and so it's it's very common in the body of christ for people to be operating in the flesh and not know it because they're not you know raping and pillaging you know and so because of that Many are in the body of Christ thinking they're doing things in their own strength and in their own flesh that make God happy and God's not impressed. And it just exhausts us. We've seen that the term those who are in the flesh refers to lost people. And Paul points out that lost people cannot please God. And that might seem harsh, but it's a reality which becomes more understanding as we look into the meaning of the word please. What does that mean? So according to the complete word dictionary, which is my, my favorite Bible dictionary to work, I use the Strong's a lot. Sometimes I use the Vines. But this is um, written by a guy named uh, Spiro Zoidiades, and it, it defines every word in, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek New Testament. So every word in the New Testament is um, defined by this Greek guy, 
Spiro Zodiades. And so I love that that um, that um, resource. You can buy that book for like 60 bucks off of Amazon or at a Christian bookstore if they still exist. Or you can go to, um, um, I use something called eSword, and you can get that module, and I use it all the time in my study uh, because, because it defines things correctly. So this is what that resource, just, just pause for a second. Have you noticed that when, often when you have someone teaching in the body of Christ, they want to maintain this, this sense, this awe of being more important and more knowledgeable than you know the people that are sitting in the pews often or in the Bible study. So they often won't give their resources, and it's because of insecurity, I believe. Um, you know, one time I was in the oil business, and there was a guy named Tim that I worked for. And he was giving us these jobs that, I mean, to do, these tasks that were so boring, and, and anybody could have done it. A, chim, a, a trained chimpanzee could have done some of the stuff we were doing. And I said, Tim, why don't, you, why don't you teach us some of the stuff you know, and then we could take that load off your shoulders, because you're always complaining about having too much to do, and then you can find more interesting things to do that we can't do because we don't know what you know. And he said, but if you know what I know, then you can replace me. And I was stunned. And I said, I said, dude, I'm studying to get a master's in Christian counseling. I don't want your job. You know, I, I want to do something else with my life. I think God wants me to do something else. But that's the reason that so many who teach in the body of Christ will never talk about the concordances they use or the the Bible dictionaries they use or the background information because they're afraid of being replaced. And I'm thinking our role as as leaders in the body of Christ is to train replacements. Y'all are gonna go somewhere I'm never gonna get. Y'all are gonna know some people I'm never gonna meet. We all need to be equally equipped. Right? That's why that's why I believe in talking about like this complete word study dictionary. It's a beautiful resource. And uh, I have my I have a paper copy at home and I've given away two or three people that are to two or three people, given them copies because they were so serious about their Bible study. Well this, this is what he says. According to the complete word study dictionary, the word please means to, to make one inclined to, to be content with, to soften one's heart toward another. In the New Testament, the meaning has evolved from the passive being pleased to the active to please, which means it, pass, it, it, it passes from a relationship to a behavior. Now, what, that real, what does it matter? Well, what, what, it matters because until we're born again through Christ, there is no relationship with God. Lost people have no relationship with God. We do. What is the relationship? Father, children, right? And so they don't have that. God is not their father, even if they say it. Um, they are not God's children. Uh, a lot of times you hear, all people are God's children. That's not true. You become a child of God when you become born again. To those who received Jesus as Lord, he gave the right to become children of the Most High God. And the people who didn't choose to receive Jesus as Lord didn't get that right. They are not children of the Most High God. In, in John 1, 1 uh, 12 to 13, I just quoted from memory. I'm going to paste it here so you can have it too. It says, but as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God, because God said so. This was what he set up. This is how he wants it to work. 
So what, if what, God, what pleases God is when our behavior flows out of relationship with Him, lost people truly cannot please Him. Since there's no relationship there with God. When you look at it, it's sadly black and white, isn't it? This is why I cringe whenever someone says all people are God's people. All people are not God's people, but can be if they will humble themselves and receive Jesus and receive God on His terms. So I want to go back and, and look at this definition out of the Complete Word Study Dictionary and kind of go off my notes here because I think the Lord is hammering something in my heart and maybe uh, someone else needs to hear it too. He says, in the New Testament, the meaning of the word translated as please, to please God has evolved from the passive being pleased to the active to please. And then he says this beautiful statement, passing from a relationship to behavior. Here's what's on my mind. I got born again in October 1986 and immediately was free in Christ. And immediately, a guy I love gave me a study guide, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. Can't remember the name of it. Um, but what it was, was a 52-week study that was a legalistic way to take my behavior and make my behavior please God out of my own flesh. The Beginnings of Our Confidence is the name of it. And I still have a copy of it somewhere at home in my, in my records. And it was a well-meaning gesture. It was what passed for discipleship in our non-denomination denomination. denomination. Um, but it was completely backwards. What wasn't stressed in that group and isn't stressed in much of Christendom is the fact that when we're born again, a relationship is forged in Christ with God and we're related to God. When I was a kid, there were some little kids from down the street and they were always getting in fights with every other kid on our block. And one day, the whole bunch of them, like the whole family, like six or eight of these kids, were going to jump me and beat me up. So I ran home and I ran in my gate and closed, closed the gate. And I ran up on the porch and they were on the other side of the gate. And one of the kids called me a name. And I think it's one of the most vile ways to use the word mother that there is. And he called me that. And I didn't know what it was because my dad never said that word. And uh, words like that, and they said bad words, but not that word. And I didn't know that my mom was on the other side of the screen door and could, she was seeing all this and hearing it. All I knew was that it was a, it was a, um, all I knew was that it was an insult. So I said it back. And I said, you're a, and I said the same sounds, not knowing anything about them. And my mom picked me up by the back of my t-shirt and I, my feet didn't touch the floor until I had a bar of soap in my mouth in the bathroom. And she washed my mouth out, literally washed my mouth out with a bar of cashmere bouquet soap, which I don't even think um, exists anymore. But if it did, I wouldn't buy it because I don't think I could stand the taste or the smell, right? Um, I didn't know what I did wrong. And what she said to me was this. She said, McInerney's don't say things like that. And what she was saying was that a behavior... She might not have known it, but she was saying, our behavior flows 
out of our relationship. And your relationship is with McInerney's, with people with my last name, and other people that I'm related to, right? If we will grab a hold and meditate on and ask the Lord to drive it deep into our spirits, who we are as part of the family of God, about the relationship between our Father and our siblings in Christ, between Jesus and ourselves, that we are children of the Most High God and begin to look to Him for guidance through His Spirit in how to live, then a behavior will do what He says here, passing from relationship to behavior. Our behavior will flow out of our relationship. What it won't do is backwash and make a relationship happen. You see my point? There's a big difference in Christendom. There's so much focus on works because the flesh is works oriented. And the lost state of man is works oriented. And so we always look for something on the outside to affect how we are on the inside as long as our mind is set on the things below and not on the things above. But when we begin to see ourselves in terms of our Father who is above and allow His life to flow through us from on high, through us on the earth, then our relationship that flows out, flows out in terms of our behavior, in terms of our beliefs, in terms of our standards, in terms of what makes us aghast and what brings us joy will change because it will pass from this relationship we have with Him to external behavior on the earth. Does that make sense? I believe it does. But I thought that, that, that needed to be addressed. We must, and I, I just want to challenge you between now and next time, and if you see something different, interrupt the study with that and say, I am seeing something that I haven't seen before and I've been trying to meditate on it and focus on it and it's yielded this. We'd love to hear the praise reports from something like that. It's important because many of our brothers and sisters out there and maybe in, in the room today with us have never really dwelled on their relationship with Christ, although they said it in a very light way, a real shallow way way, which is what I did for years, and still have a tendency to do now. I mean, for a long time, it was just hard to accept knowing what I've done wrong and knowing some of the thoughts that creep around in there, that God really does love us that much and loves me and accepts me. Not everything I come up with, but me. The essential who I am, the eternal me, and you have that eternal you, and he does that for you too. So I hope that detour was worth it. And uh, feel free to comment. Nobody's saying anything, and that's fine. It just makes me wonder, am I am I still broadcasting? I can't tell because um, it doesn't show that on my metrics here, you know. I think it is. I think it's going well. So, so um, so Paul now moves on in his letter to the Christians in Rome and also to us in Romans 8, 9. And I believe we can get some of 8, 9 done tonight. I don't know about you, but talking about this sort of thing energizes me. Yay, Jeff, it's, and I'm glad you're here. Thanks for letting me know you're here. Um, I just want, you never know, you know, sometimes Facebook can get squirrely. Sometimes my internet connection can, but it's been pretty good. Um, he says, but if, he, but you, so he says, remember the last verse, he said, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Here in this verse, he starts off, with, with the uh, contrast, he says, but you, talking to believers like you and I, but you are not in the flesh. Why? You're not lost. But you're in the spirit. Why? Because you're born again. 
since indeed, because the word if can mean since, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he isn't his. He's not his. The Apostle Paul starts this line, Romans 8, 9, by making a crucial distinction. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. He is telling us that what he said in verse 8 does not apply to us because we are born again. Why do we know this? The word translated as if often means since in the Greek. Paul tells them that they're in the Spirit because the Spirit of God dwells in them. That's why. He says this in a matter-of-fact way because to him and to other first century Christians, this was a basic understanding which has got lost in all the fragmenting of the body of Christ and all kinds of extra-biblical teaching and prosperity gospel and junk and you know, and, and you know, um, cessationism, you know, believing that the Holy Spirit somehow isn't active anymore because 60% of the body of Christ says so, so I guess God the Holy Spirit has to obey that. There are some denominations today which use a term that is nowhere to be found in the Bible, but which develop because of the first part of Romans 8 and 9. So that's the genesis of this statement. And that term is, I invited Jesus into my heart. Now I have a whole lot of friends, and a, a lot of, and I'm ordained, you know, in, in this group, but um, that say this, but it's not a biblical statement. The truth is that when we confess Jesus as Lord, a lot happens. And um, one thing is that the Holy Spirit baptizes, I mentioned this a little bit earlier in tonight's study, that the Holy Spirit baptizes us, or if you will, places us into Jesus. And this is how we come to be in Him or in the Spirit, like the Scripture teaches. Now, I, I have the verse here that I referred to earlier, and so we can, we can uh, quote it, so you can have it and be equipped with it. Um, and this is where the Apostle Paul basically says, this is, this is how you got saved, folks. For by one Spirit, Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, into Christ. And you can also look in the body of Christ. So this is why I believe there's one church. And I, I recognize that there are people that identify with subsects and sub splinters of that one body. But from God's perspective, there's one church. He actually says that in Ephesians. Um, <clears throat> one, one spirit, one body, you know, um, um, and, and one church. But, but um, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. This is true either whether for Jews or for Greeks, whether they were slaves or free men, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. What does that mean? Well, all who have done, we're different, and now we're able to drink of, God has remade us, redesigned us, so that now we can draw from the Holy Spirit of God, whereas a lost person cannot receive the Holy Spirit of God except to cry out to Jesus for salvation, receive him as Lord, confess him by name, and that spirit one Spirit will baptize them into Christ. As that happens, the Holy Spirit populates the born-again human spirit, which had been functionally dead because the life of God was not in there prior to being born again. And Jesus promised that this would happen. And we're going to wrap up with this statement. And then we're going to look we're going to look, um, we're not going to be able to finish Romans 8 and 9 tonight. Um, we're going to wrap up with this statement from Jesus, who says in John 14, 16 and 17, he predicted or prophesied that this would happen to us when we were born again. He says, 
I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of Truth, one of the Holy Spirit's many names, just like Jesus has many titles, so does the Spirit of God, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you. He was dwelling with them in, in the body of Jesus and Jesus' spirit, because Jesus was spiritually alive. And he says, and will be in you. But you are not in the flesh. You're in the spirit because since indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Well, that's where we're going to stop for tonight. Now I've got to wrap this up and then run down the hall. Um, Wari didn't come yet. I guess she'll be here in a minute. Um, she's going to be... She's going to be um, coming to visit and be on my radio show tonight. Um, so we're going to pray, and then we're going to close with some, some, um, some announcements, some, some, some things. So, Father, I thank you so much for the study. I thank you for those who came to be a part of our study today, and I ask you to bless them um, and take anything that I might have taught that was incorrect, and I ask you to, um, to not allow it to be a part of them and not take residence in their, in their souls if it wasn't true. I ask you to bless them and protect them from any error that I or anyone else might teach. And we try to do our best to teach the truth. And, um, but I want you to do that in case I ask you to uh, protect them. I ask you to take the things that were true, sink them deep within their soul, and I ask that you um, that you allow them to flourish in those things to um, meditate on those things, for them to take root in them and grow and, and draw them closer to what you have for them to be. So I thank you for that. And I ask you to be with those who are ill. Father, I ask you to be with the, the family that had a memorial service last week for the woman that we uh, raised money for to, to um, have cremated after her, uh, act, her death in a terrible auto accident. I ask you to be with her daughter and with her, um, her mother who is um, in her 80s and, and uh, struggling to deal with these things. I ask you to be with anyone who's sick. I ask you to be with those who are in any kind of need and cause um, your, your body to move to meet those needs. I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So as always, I am um, pasting a verse. I mean, a, a link that you can go to, and this will allow you to see last week's video on our YouTube channel, and also uh, will allow you to see this week's after midnight tonight. Um, this is another link that you can go to. Amen, Kevin, I'm glad to see you here. And this is where articles are that you can go to and um, and and be able to uh, study on your own some things that we have um, that I've written about all kinds of stuff. Hi, Laurie. Hi. Laurie's here. Say hi to your adoring fans. Hello. Laurie's back. She's gonna she's gonna be on Truth Seeker Texas Radio, which is the next link that I'm gonna post. Say hi, Laurie. Hi. And y'all could say hi, Lori, back to her. But they, they can't talk. Well, they can, but we won't hear. We don't. Know okay. Yeah. And uh, so this is the radio station. If you want to um, listen in on your um, whatever device you have, um, we're device friendly and diverse. And so you can do that. And then if you would like to call in, Lori is teaching about a topic that she, she learned about the distinction, which is very important. From a book called *The Parenting*, *The Bible Parenting Code* by John Rosman, Roseman, um, which is the difference, the distinction between biblical child rearing and parenting, and 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 the effect, and, and it ain't positive. Um, <coughs> hi, Laurie. Back to her from Kevin. Um, 
This is the phone number that you can call if you just want to say hi to Laurie over the phone and be on the air, or if you have questions or comments about what she taught last week and what's been playing all this week on our rebroadcast, um, or you can um, call and talk about tonight's show. So um, we've got to go down and make the commute down the hallway to our uh, worldwide studios, and then and then we'll see you next time. Thank you for being a part of our broadcast here today. I will post this ver this video up later. And um, I, I thought we, we hit a lot of meat tonight. So God bless you. I love you. How's it go like that? I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Want to see what we look like? There you are. Yeah, yeah. There she is. She looks great. <coughs> love you all. See you later. Bye.